Uh, I apologize for the clumsiness of the of the title, and I'm sure it's not compensated for by its uh, fanciness or, or elegance or anything like that. It's also somewhat pretentious, as you will find out in, in a moment. Uh, anyway, it's about uh, modeling risks, risks in modeling, in construing economic expertise and, and so forth, for managing this expertise uh, in the time of, of crisis and, and all that. So I, I would uh, first like to warn you what this uh, uh, talk is not about. It's not a, an attempt to give a true account of the crisis or a true account of the role of economics in relation to the crisis. It's rather about uh, providing a framework for investigating and debating possible failings of economics in relation to the crisis, especially when economics is conceived as a modeling discipline. It's heavily dependent on, on modeling style of inquiry. So you will be learning a framework and then we can perhaps use the framework for further conversations questions and uh, possible answers. Uh, expertise. Expertise can be perceived as based on epistemic competence and authority. That's an obvious uh, premise we can start with. Uh, this competence is, the exercise of this competence is risky. It involves the possibility of making uh, errors, mistakes of all sorts, failures, etc. And therefore, full epistemic competence should include competence to exercise risk management, to be able to identify those risks and manage them somehow. And, and it's in, in this sort of uh, uh, setting that I will be pursuing my account of uh, modeling failure and uh, risk management in relation to modeling failure. So the task is to identify the loci of epistemic risks and their management in a modeling discipline like economics. Modeling itself is a very complex activity, human activity, so there are numerous ways in which things may go wrong when people use, build and use models for whatever purpose. That's something you will learn about. Models are not uh, easy and simple things at all. So if we think of the crisis in, in the economy, uh, as a failure, then of course this gives rise to a sort of blame game. Who or what is to be blamed for the crisis? Uh, there is this old saying, success has a hundred fathers, but failure is an orphan. Uh, nobody wants to take the blame for, for the failure, but everybody wants to take the, the uh, honor of, of, for, for success. But this time is different, to use this phrase uh, in this connection. Uh, there is a proliferation of fathers, of failure. I mean, nobody admits, nobody adopts the, the charge, but, uh, but this charge has been uh, attributed to the number of uh, possible blameworthy uh, uh, parties. Mm -hmm. uh, then, then, of course, we would need to make a difference, be distinction between causal and moral responsibility. Um, it's, it's one thing to, to attribute the causes of the crisis to whatever, and the other thing to morally blame uh, whatever is morally blameworthy in, in principle. And this, this, uh, this very idea of blame is being used in these discussions uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a rather careless uh, fashion, because much of the time it's a matter of uh, causal responsibility, and then the very notion of blame does not apply. So obviously, uh, in order to attribute blame, these these uh, causes of the crisis would have to be personifiable, so to speak. Bankers, central bankers, rating agents, politicians, economists, whoever. But it's always a who rather than what. And then uh, so there are some non-personifiable. Uh, items such as the financialized global economy, the big thing, uh, structural imbalances in the economy, neoliberalism, hormones, uh, ac the academic discipline of economics, etc., etc. Those are not as easily to blameworthy in uh, made blameworthy in moral terms. Now. Thinking of the uh, candidates for cause or blame, uh, the standard ones, of course, the 
most of them share this, this element of uh, excessive leverage. And then the question is, what's behind it? Why? Why did it come about? And then, then references made to global imbalances, loose monetary policy, growing income in inequalities. And regulation, of course, is, is absolutely always part of these uh, this, uh, uh, discussions. There has been either too much of it or too little of it, or of wrong kind. Uh, too much if uh, it has been because of promoting home ownership in the US, too little uh, uh, for obvious reasons, etc. Sorry. Uh, so, too much. Uh, let it go. It will take care of everything. Uh, and then, too little. I mean, it will lead to chaos and full lack of discipline and and, and all that. And it will. Oop, this is very sensitive. And then it will give give rise to this monster, which is beyond control and 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 so forth. There are of course more exotic uh, candidates for cause or blame, such as video games, and because it's this generation that learned to play these games and then you know, everything is just a game, you know, something uh, not, not really real. Uh, and uh, another one is the male chemistry, uh, these reckless uh, risk-taking uh, youngsters uh, misusing our monies in the financial market, etc. Uh, some serious hypotheses have been put forward in, in these terms too, and who knows whether they play a role. Greed is, greed is of course, a very popular uh, thing to mention in this connection. Uh, but if we take greed to be a universal human trait, a sort of human uh, disposition that each of us and always have been in, in possession of, then it's not a causal difference maker and so can't possibly explain the crisis. Maybe it's, it plays a role, but it's, uh, it's not a, the explainer. But of course, there is always the possibility that the actualization and maybe even the strength of this uh, behavioral disposition of greed uh, depends on, on various kinds of circumstances, as, such as the, the regulative regime, etc. Maybe even economics education. There are studies that indicate that uh, economic students are more sort of selfish, egoistic than other students, and that's possibly because they have taken economics uh, classes, things like that. Okay, but let's then converge to our, our focus, uh, which is economics. I mean, one of the many candidates for, for blame or cause of the crisis. Uh, this is among the most harsh judgments that we find in the economics, uh, Economist uh, magazine in 2009. Of all the bubbles, economic bubbles that have been pricked, few have burst more spectacularly than the reputation of economics itself. This has been on the front uh, page of the, of the issue of the Economist. Uh, and then the question, what went wrong with economics? So something went wrong with economics and therefore economics is to be uh, blamed. And this is also our question. Uh, we need to analyze this, this very idea that something uh, went wrong and or possibly has gone wrong with economics. The very notion of failure, I mean, there are many, many, many ways in which uh, such things as economics may fail, anticipating what will happen, uh, conceiving what might happen, uh, understanding what happens, has happened, etc., uh, preventing or helping prevent ex ante what uh, will or might happen in the future, and once it had, has happened, treating it or guiding, uh, say, policymakers ex post to, to deal with the problem and, and things like that. And all these charges have been made. Economics has been blamed to fail in all these all these ways, but of course they are very different ways of, of failing. I will not uh, sort of deal with them separately, uh, but I will point out some important differences between them uh, too. Now, 
once economics has been uh, charged, once it has once it has been uh, blamed for these failures, uh, they themselves often appeal to they they become apologetic and start uh, excusing themselves and, and so forth. Among the uh, typical excuses is the sort of social epistemological excuse, as, uh, as we might call it. It's a matter, it's a way of allocating epistemic responsibility so evenly that actually no one is uh, blameworthy anymore. Uh, no one saw this coming, so I'm no worse than anyone else in not seeing it coming. Everybody failed. So nobody can actually be blamed. It's very typical, also in other contexts. Another one is an appeal to a metaphysical uh, principle. The world is so immensely complex that uh, you know it's it's almost impossible to ask us to to have a sufficiently uh, comprehensive and detailed understanding of it, and not to speak about anticipating what will happen, etc. Com this complexity rhetoric is very popular uh, nowadays, indeed. And this really has an implication of uh, diminishing the epistemic and practical powers of, of not only scientists, but also policymakers in front of this huge complex monster that we are dealing with. And then uh, another typical appeal is in terms of epistemic goals of uh, economics as a discipline. I mean. Economics has been uh, demanded to provide predictions and this patience, etc., and is blamed for failing in that. But now they say we were not supposed to provide predictions at all. It, actually, economic theory itself, the core theory we believe in, implies that accurate prediction is impossible. So, failure to attain this particular goal, prediction, uh, is no failure at all. So uh, we, we should uh, inform those who blame us that uh, they have misunderstood our goal. This was no, not our goal and it, it will not be our goal and therefore failure to uh, serve this goal is no failure at all. Okay, now it, uh, this, this combines the various uh, uh, things here. I mean, the economy has become so complex that everybody would be helpless in front of it. So we are no worse than any, anyone else. And it's, uh, the task is close to impossible, etc. And, and that's a very uh, nice way of uh, escaping the, the criticisms. One might be able to, to tell uh, stories with hindsight after the fact. Once things, things have happened, then we can, might trace the causal trajectory by way of which things do, or things have happened, but in advance we can't anticipate that this will happen or, or that thing will happen and in what way. And I think, I think the, the, the books we read about uh, the crisis now, they often tell these, these uh, exposed narratives rather than you know, uh, provide a, a theory that could be used for anticipating or conceiving further crises. And here is an important uh, distinction I would like to emphasize between predicting and conceiving, because here is a, a major, a very important failure. Even though uh, economists could not be asked to provide actual predictions, they could be asked to be able to conceive crises of this sort. So uh, they can fail to predict in various ways. I mean, prediction itself is a very sort of um, uh, multiple thing, many-sided uh, thing, multifarious aspects in it, etc. There is a failure that something is coming. There is, sorry, uh, there's a prediction that something is coming, prediction uh, when it's coming, giving a, a time uh, for it, and the prediction uh, uh, with what quantitative characteristic, uh, characteristics that thing is coming. And these, these are all uh, concerned with actual events. What will happen? That the thing will happen when and, and with what strength and, and things like that. And that's very different from failure of conception. <coughs> Conceiving of what is possible within a system 
given the sorts of causal mechanism that the system contains, is something very different from predicting what will happen, when it will happen, and, and things like that. And this is, this is the major failure. This is really, it's far more serious than, than failing to predict. The, the models that economists have entertained did not even uh, help economists conceive the possibility of this kind of crisis coming. And that's, that's serious uh, indeed. So the uh, relationship between conceiving and predicting is, is such that one must have conceived that some process of phenomenon is possible. It might happen in order to attempt to predict it uh, at all. So um, this is the situation. I mean, the, the two guys on the left, I mean, they just, you know, just were not attentive enough or something like that. Had, 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 had the one taken the, his glasses off, he might have seen what is going on, etc. Likewise with the, the, with the guy in the middle. But this one, this guy on, on the right, I mean, there is no way that he could have even conceived of that kind of thing uh, happening. So economists have uh, portrayed by this figure uh, in their failure of conceiving the kind of crisis. Okay, what about cognitive risks and their, their management? <clears throat> there are many kinds of con cognitive risk of, risks, of course, involved here. Failing to set worthwhile goals for one's inquiries. Setting goals that are unattainable. Mis misjudging the difficulty of attaining those goals. Employing wrong or ineffective means for their uh, attainment. Okay, and once we have a list of uh, uh, cognitive risks of this kind, and it can be surely extended, then the challenge of risk management can be uh, drafted. For, for instance, asking that uh, the risk manager would be identifying the sources of possible failure, estimating the risk of failure in each uh, such case, setting both worthwhile and attainable goals for uh, inquiry, choosing the goals and means so that, so that they match, so that indeed the means serve the attainment of the goals, and then communicating the risk of failure to relevant audiences, rather than pretending to know more or to be capable of more than actually is the case. It's those kinds of things that I will be highlighting uh, in a more systematic uh, manner in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Now, just very briefly, this is one of the most famous statements by, by Nobel Prize winning Paul, Paul Krugman in New York Times. Uh, the economics profession went astray because economics as a group mistook beauty and an impressive looking mathematics for truth. I mean, this is, it's kind of di diagnostics, uh, it's, it's extremely loose, and um, by the way, it's also a very, very rare statement in that it appeals to the notion of truth. I will be saying something more about that, I and mean, it relates to this notion of expertise that has been floating around here in this room in these two, two, two days. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I didn't want to pay too much attention to this, but uh, um, it's, a, it's a widely cited uh, uh, statement. So, thinking of putting everything here in terms of models. Now we, we, are, we are moving towards the very idea of economics being a modeling discipline. There are two classes of models that, that have been the, of the uh, major suspects, uh, major candidates for failure financial set of financial models and set of uh, macroeconomic models. I will not go into the details of those models. I think the audience does not uh, need that. Uh, and these are then uh, suspected having uh, some unfortunate properties. They contain utterly unrealistic elements having nothing to do with the real world, etc. They, and, and this is very important, of course, they manifest excessive reliance on the efficiency enhancing and self-stabilizing properties of markets. And this is, of course, very, very recognizable by, by most of us. 
Okay, another way of put, uh, another way of talking about models and modeling is to uh, talk about surrogate reasoning. Models are surrogate systems, surrogate objects, and uh, taking models as surrogate objects um, uh, and modeling as surrogate reasoning is to say that we we try to examine an object in the real world by examining another object. Uh, rather than examining the real-world object directly, we rather examine the surrogate object directly in order to indirectly, I mean, I think it's uh, given next, in order to indirectly learn or acquire information about the target object in the uh, real world. And now surrogate objects, that is, models are needed because the target object is so much more complex it I mean in some other disciplines it might be very far away in the distant past uh, very small or something like that there are reasons for having to model those objects rather than uh, examining them directly in the case of economics models are needed because the the target object is so uh, complex Complexity must be reduced and, and uh, manipulated, managed epistemically. So it's a, it's a very powerful method. It's sort of unavoidable that this method of modeling uh, is being used. You can't escape it. But because it's a matter of surrogate reasoning, its use is very, very risky. So the risks of failure are quite remarkable. And therefore, risk management is called for. My major complaint is that economics has not been very good in risk management. It has taken huge epistemic risks by using this method that is uh, inescapable, must be used, but uh, the management of the risks that are involved has not succeeded very well. And that's, that's also one reason why the method itself might have lead, led to uh, some unfortunate consequences. There are those who say that modeling is a bad thing in, in general. It should be banned entirely. It should not be applied. It's, it's, uh, economics is doing a, a wrong thing by engaging itself in modeling at all. So let's forget about uh, modeling. And this could be construed as e uh, extreme risk aversity, epistemic risk aversity, because modeling involves risks, and those risks are so huge and hard to manage Therefore, let's avoid taking those risks at all. Mm -hmm. And it's, therefore, let's forget about modeling as a method. And let's, let's address reality directly, so to speak. But there are many, many problems with this. Uh, it's not based on an elaborate account of model and modeling at all. Uh, when you read this literature that provides these uh, 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 statements, it's really not very elaborate at all. Um, and then, of course, there is no direct access to reality available. I mean, models are needed. Access to reality is always mediated somehow. And, and therefore, modeling in one way or another is uh, a necessity. And these statements also tend to uh, conflate uh, models and modeling in general as a method surrogate reasoning in general, and then particular kinds of models and modeling strategies that, for instance, we find in certain parts of economics or, or whatever. All right. Now, now we are approaching the, the account of my account of uh, models or modeling. Uh, and I'll simply uh, first refer to the standard literature and philosophy of science. This is a hot topic in philosophy of science, by the way, nowadays. It's, it's been so for the last 15 or so years. And there's been a lot of progress uh, taking place. It's all started with the recognition that, I mean, the, the sort of previous old-fashioned recognition that, that, that model, uh, models are sort of two-placed. M is a model of target R. That's all. And then it started, uh, it, uh, enrichment uh, were pro uh, proposed there is always an agent using something as a model uh, of something else. 
and then a purpose was added to the picture. So here it's, uh, it's uh, already uh, uh, four-placed. My, my proposal makes models and modeling far, far richer than, than this, and I think it, it, it might be useful for understanding these modeling failures in, in, in economics. So let's, let's see how, how things go. So we have a model, and it's a representation of some target out there in the world. There is an agent using the model, using M as a representation of, of the target for some purpose. But always we need to be very specific about those purposes for which the models are being used in regard to the target. And this is one of my novelties at an audience. Models are always for some audience or, or another. And this will be useful also for analyzing the failures of economic modeling. Then the idea that, that uh, models are, and this has to do with the ontology of models, as it were, what are models made of, what kind of things are they? And, and this is the idea, the, uh, the cloud there suggests that models are imagined objects. They are like, like fantasies, they are fantasy worlds, as it were. They are often small, simple, nicely behaving fantasy worlds. Uh, so, um, and, and therefore one should not conflate models with their descriptions. Models can be those fantasy worlds, these imagined systems can be described variously by, for, for, for instance, verbally, uh, mathematically, geometrically, using graphs and, and arrows and boxes and, and, and things like that, whatever. There are many ways of describing these fantasy worlds, these imagined uh, objects. So this distinction between the model itself and its various descriptions might be, might be useful for, for some purposes. Okay. And then regarding the target, the target is not always an actual ob object, it might also be a possible object. And this distinction is for some purposes very, very useful to, to make. Much of economic modeling actually is about possible objects rather than actual objects, even though the, this crisis as a possibility was uh, missed by, by economics. And then Re regarding this representational relationship between the model and the and the target, I thought of uh, um, not requiring that there is sort, some sort of sort of true representation in place already. Rather, what's uh, uh, what's uh, needed is just that this situation prompts or raises issues of relevant resemblance. Resemblance between that fantasy world is simple. Uh, imagined fantasy world and the real world system. Uh, there must be some resemblance for the modeling being serving a, some, 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 of some purposes. Uh, and uh, of course, relevant, uh, sorry, resemblance is a matter of how these two objects relate to one another, the imagined fantasy world and then the real world uh, down here. But relevance, is a function of the purpose and might be also made the function of the audience, the expectations of the audience and, and things like that. So it's something pragmatic while, while resemblance is a, is a semantic relationship between the, the uh, imagined object and, uh, and the real object. And now it's quite obvious that whenever we have models, uh, we don't, uh, models are sort of not full replicas of, of the real world. They are always extremely partial and they typically al always serve a, a purpose. They are they're made, designed to serve a purpose. If you have a subway map, for instance, it's, it's not good for, it's good for travel, using the subway for traveling, to, for, from, for getting from one point to another in a city. But it's very bad for many, many other purposes. For instance, for, for walking or strolling around in the city and, and, and things like that. Um, likewise with uh, scientific uh, models. And this is another uh, novelty uh, commentary. 
this this whole thing is so so complex. It has so many component parts, and they, they can be conceived differently. Uh, they need to be identified first of all. These different components, and that's task uh, task for the commentary. The modeler must have a grasp of what's going on. Uh, she must be able to identify the purpose, the audience, <coughs> the the uh, kind of relevant resemblance that uh, that uh, she's after. And, and, and all those kinds of uh, things. So it's a way of coordinate, identifying these components in this system, in this whole, whole, whole uh, complex, uh, and then coordinating them with uh, one another. Um, and the commentary often fails, by the way. The modelers are often not very good in having a full grasp of what is going on, uh, what uh, purposes can be served and, and limitations of their models and things like that. And everything here happens in a context. <laughs> that's a, that's a um, handy way of, of um, referring to a number of different kinds of things that also play, play a role in, in this uh, modeling uh, business. So uh, what I will now do I will go through each of these component parts and, and show how failure may happen, what kind of source of failure may lie in each of these components. I will not, I cannot possibly be very, very uh, thorough, uh, so I'll, I'll go through it pretty, pretty quick, quick, quickly, but this is a sort of map for you for further explorations and, and conversations. Um, Okay, well, this is just a verbal version of that uh, account of uh, modeling. Actually, I will be using these as titles for the coming, for the subsequent uh, slides. This was all given in those, those pictures. Okay, this is, this is the basic idea. Uh, these elements in this account framework of models modeling uh, potential loci or sources of failure. So it provides a framework for tracing and diagnosing modeling failures of different kinds. Okay, this, it seems that this will be repeated, this whole thing will be repeated and then we'll focus on, on one element at a time. First, the agent. The identity of the agent makes a difference for, for the whole endeavor. Uh, for what sorts of models are being built and examined, what is taken seriously as a model with some further attention. For instance, who is a, a credible economist? Who qualifies as a credible member of the economics profession? If you're not a credible member of the profession, whatever model, however fancy and, and insightful model you build, more attention will be paid uh, to it by the economics profession. So it matters a great deal who the agent uh, is. Now individual and collective agency, I'm dealing collective agency would be the economics profession and all that. They interact and depend on one another. The individuals proposing models have been socialized in the collective disciplinary culture and prevalent fashions of, of that, uh, of that uh, discipline. And then, on the other hand, the individual must pursue the collective to join her in using an object as, as a model. Not, that's not always always easy. Certain rhetorical, etc., conventions must be conformed to in order to succeed in, in, in this task. Of course, uh, failures of all sorts are, are possible uh, with, with, with respect to this uh, component. Um, but uh, I will not say more about that. Now, so the next the component, the model itself, the imagined object uh, itself, uh, even though it's a multi-component object, it's, it's very limited, very selective, very simplified, etc. <laughs> models typically isolate some tiny slices of the world. Theoretical models in economics are, are analogical to a laboratory experiment, actually whereby um, highly idealizing, simplifying assumptions are used for controlling other things, not letting them have a causal impact on, on what is uh, the focus uh, of, uh, of uh, investigation. 
and, and that's why isolation would be a good metaphor for understanding this aspect of, uh, of modeling. But this is how uh, complexity is being reduced and, and made manageable, tractable for further inquiries. So surrogate reasoning requires that the direct object of inquiry is manageable, it's tractable, and, and various uh, uh, methods of reasoning can be applied to it. And then, of course, what is crucial is, is what is included and excluded from the object in this uh, uh, model uh, object. Uh, and, and major failures lie right here. Often the most important, causally most significant uh, things are excluded from the, uh, this tiny imagined uh, fantasy world. Bubble generating mechanisms have been excluded mm -hmm. and, and that's a major source of failure. That's why this, this kind of crisis was not even conceived by <coughs> economists because its possibility was not built into those models. And uh, the other side of this, uh, this failure is that uh, many of the idealizing assumptions, idealizing assumptions are always needed. I mean, it's, it's, it's no problem to have uh, false elements in one's model descriptions. That's not, not a general problem, but, but some, sometimes falsehood is, is a bad thing if, if falsehood is directed to uh, in causally important uh, elements. So uh, some, some of the idealizing assumptions have not been harmless at all. They have been very, very harmful. Assumptions such as the economy consists of one representative agent. Because this, this dismisses uh, heterogeneity of agents, their various kinds of interactions, and, and those kinds of uh, things. <coughs> Transaction costs are nil, very, very bad for, for understanding the financial uh, sector. Uh, agents have perfect information about relevant probabilities, all too strong for, for many purposes. Market prices of assets incorporate all relevant information and all that. This is, of course, the efficient market's uh, hypothesis uh, that has been uh, discussed uh, very much indeed. Okay, so we move on for further sources of failure. Uh, the target. Um, So models stand for uh, targets as their representatives. So instead of directly examining the target, we exam examine their representatives. That is the surrogate uh, systems. Uh, Real-world target systems are typically very complex. Models are ways of reducing that complexity and managing it. And this, of course, is a major source of risk because uh, uh, due attention may not be given to cause the relevant, relevant aspects of real-world complexity. I mean, the representative agent uh, models is, is a case in point. Um, for instance, there are all sorts of uh, indirect feedback mechanisms out there in the world, including the financial uh, uh, system, that should be uh, modeled. And they cannot be modeled uh, uh, with this uh, these tools that have been uh, in fashion recently. Uh, and another thing, and this has to do with the distinction between uh, actual and possible targets. Uh, much of economic modeling is, is about possible target systems. Uh, and these models contribute to how possibly explanations how possibly explanations are okay explanations. They are sort of respectful scientific explanations. How could that sort of thing possibly have uh, uh, been generated? I mean, this is how scientific inquiry typically proceeds. First, we make an observation of a phenomenon, and then we ask, how could it possibly have been caused? What possible causes or causal mechanisms might there be that could have generated that kind of phenomenon? Okay, this is how, and then we have a how possibly explanation. And how, how possibly explanation is the first step. Uh, and after that, we should take further steps towards how actually explanations. So uh, that would require that among those possible causes, we select those uh, that actually have contributed to the 
uh, phenomenon we want to explain, but that requires further empirical and other sorts of uh, inquiries. But many, many, if you if you look, uh, if if you read economics journals, etc., many, many of the models are how how possibly uh, they provide only how possibly explanations. Now, the the funny thing here is that uh, that the economics economics should have been able or could have been asked asked to provide a how possibly explanation of the kind of crisis that then emerged, but it did not, even though it's. Uh, it's uh, very competent in producing how possible explanations in general, but not for this particular phenomenon. Um, yeah, and then there is this, this is a very, very uh, typical uh, possible failure of modeling that uh, even though information is produced concerning uh, those possible targets, uh, it's not often transformed into informa information about actual targets. Um, and then we, we might uh, start speculating why, why this is so, because it's so difficult to move from, from the study of these model worlds to the study of uh, the actual world, uh, or because they are disciplinarily lazy, this part of the culture of economic inquiry, or maybe because it's ideologically appropriate, because these model worlds can be built such that they behave nicely in the sense of uh, serving some sort of ideological, political uh, interest or whatever, and it would be sort of risky to study the, how the actual world behaves, uh, and then lose the ideological power of those uh, theoretical models. Okay. Purpose. Uh, there are multiplicity of possible uh, purposes that we can imagine for uh, for economic models uh, explaining this or that aspect of, of this this and those phenomena predicting again this or that those aspects of certain phenomena designing mechanisms institutions new markets and so forth models are often used for design purposes nowadays actually the design models are very they are in the rise in, in economic inquiry simply exploring various possibilities uh, without any uh, severe constraints of any kind, solving some theoretical technical puzzles perhaps, uh, <coughs> elaborating technical tools, I mean there are, or educating an audience using a very simple model that is not claimed to have any, anything to do with the real world but useful for pedagogical purposes, etc., etc. Or, or then this ugly one, you know, I'm building this model in order to get the paper published. That's very hard to hard to defend. <laughs> These others are actually defensible. So. Um, okay, when we talk about success or failure of a model or a modeling exercise, uh, this is always relative to some purpose. So we always need to be clear about what purpose we are talking about when we charge when we attribute failure or uh, success to a model. What success or failure is always a function of a purpose. This is often forgotten. Um, now, a model can, be fa can fail in relation to one set of purposes and be very successful in relation to another set of uh, purposes and, and therefore uh, it's often, there's often a misunderstanding in a criticism of a model because <coughs> the, the purpose was not fully understood. Um, all right, this is very interesting. Uh, could it be that the anticipation and understanding of the crisis and its kin uh, was not among the purposes of, of economics? Uh, and why not? because that sort of thing was not believed to happen. I mean, my large parts of the economics profession actually had this belief, this sort of thing will not happen. They, they I mean, it, it was even part of the official self-understanding of macroeconomics that the, the, the era of major cycles is over. We will not see anything like that anymore. <laughs> and uh, so forth, and therefore economic modeling should not uh, have a purpose of understanding these sorts of phenomena uh, at all. 
for my, maybe it's not, I mean, the, of course, part, part of this explanation would be that it's not academically rewarding to investigate uh, 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 these sorts of models that would uh, help understand these sorts of crises. Uh, but more about that perhaps uh, in a moment. But then, of course, we, we should be prepared to, to have a debate over and critically examine those purposes themselves. We, we might want to require that economics uh, would include among its ambitions uh, the study of uh, those sorts of phenomena that matter a great deal for the rest of us. So don't, don't, they, they should not uh, do whatever they, they please. They should be our servants and study phenomena that are important for us and, and so forth. And so in, in a sense, it's, it's via the debate over these purposes of economic modeling that uh, sort of the general public or some sort of democratic control over economic inquiry could be exercised, possibly. Okay, audience. Um, the primary audience of, of economic model modelers, of course, is the, the, the other academic economists reading top journals in the same field, etc. And the possible critical or corrective feedback is, is often uh, dealing with uh, technical uh, details in these, these models rather than any foundational big, big things. Um, but then there are many, many sorts of secondary audiences like the general public, the policymakers, economists in other research fields, other social scientists, and, and so forth. And of course, here we have a delay with delivering the latest wisdom uh, to these uh, audiences because uh, uh, the message should first be turned into a sort of accessible, maybe popularized uh, form in order to be. Uh, received by these other uh, uh, audiences, and it's here. I mean, some of the the risks lie right here because these audiences, because they are sort of not fully literate mm -hmm. in 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 reading economic, the most sophisticated economic models, and all the provisos that are typically included in those models, uh, they they only receive the simple versions of those models and, and of course simplicity is very dangerous. That's very risky. I mean, simplicity serves <laughs> policy purposes very well. They, they become sort of easy recipes that, that can be turned into political slogans and, 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 and things like that. And then models all of models. Yes, exactly, exactly. And then, then all, the, all those uh, refinements and qualifications and provisos that actually are part of good scientific models are, are forgotten. In, when, when these audiences receive uh, the, the, the message. Okay. Um, right. This issue of relevant uh, resemblance between the model, the fantasy world, and, and the target system. Uh, relevant resemblance is important uh, it's, it's required in order for the modeler to, to learn about the real world, the real target uh, system from the study of uh, models. It's a representative object. And um, in this sense, surrogate modeling, uh, in, in this sense, models serve as sort of bridges to the uh, real world. They indeed serve, serve a useful purpose for uh, getting a grasp of or acquiring information about the uh, real-world uh, targets. And here, <coughs> failure, of course, can happen and does happen. Economists would be, when exercising surrogate modeling, they would uh, try to access the real world. They would try to use those uh, fantasy worlds in order to understand whatever the epistemic goal is, the real world uh, target. And they would try to secure sufficient uh, amount of relevant resemblance between their model uh, object and the real world object. And then they, they could fail, okay? For whatever reason, there might be a failure, but there is an attempt, and this attempt would be, uh, would fail. Whereas substitute, what I call substitute model, 
modeling. This is a distinction I, I found somewhat useful. Surrogate modeling is okay, and, and you can fail, but it's a different kind of failure from when you exercise only substitute model, modeling. Models here are just islands. They are not bridges to the real world. They are sort of self-contained imaginary islands, and there is no attempt even to bridge the gap between the imaginary object and the real world uh, uh, system. So there is no attempt and therefore there can't be a failure in the attempt. Okay, so, so the issue of resemblance actually is, does not arise at all in the case of substitute, substitute modeling. And now of course this is a very, very popular accusation. Uh, the charge goes that much of economic modeling is, is like this, substitute modeling only. They only live in their fantasy worlds and examine those fantasy <coughs> worlds and don't care about uh, how those fantasy worlds relate to the real world and, and, and so forth. Okay, reasons for why, 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 why there is a failure to raise issues of resemblance between the model world and the real world. Maybe a div division of uh, scientific labor is such that uh, there is a group of uh, economists specializing in examining only those imagined uh, worlds, only the, the models and their properties and their behavior, etc. And on <coughs> another group of people specializing in studying how these model worlds relate to actual real world uh, targets. But of course then this division of labor might fail. Maybe they don't uh, connect with one another or something, something like that. One party fails to do their job and so forth. And then there's a temporal version of this. You know, now we examine uh, the properties and behavior of these imagined model worlds, and later we check whether they somehow relate to the behavior and properties of the actual real world uh, target system. And this also made, there's typically a promise, by the way. Economists say, we promise we will later uh, check whether there is a connection with the real world, but that later time perhaps never comes. That's also very typical. Um, okay. Now, Linking this with, with the notion of the issue of expertise, uh, we might say that relevant resemblance is akin to relevant truth. Okay, this is an interpretation of, of this uh, connection between the model and the real world target. And then we might say that expertise based on epistemic authority relies on having privileged access to objective truth. And I think we have heard that sort of thing here. <coughs> that expertise come, comes with the claim to have, to be in possession of the, the, the truth or objective truth or something like that. And from this it would follow that economic experts would claim to know the relevant truth. But this is wrong. They don't. I mean, they just, it's, it's part of the official self-understanding of, of the economics discipline that they try to be cautious about it. They, they try to be modest in a sense. We are not claiming to find truths. They actually refuse to use the very notion of truth. And when they, they are pressed, they say, no, 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 the you know, models are just convenient, useful. Uh, they work or fail to work and, and, and things like that. Um, so, Insightful comes closest to, to being true, but even that, it's not clear what that means, what they mean by that, but it's a very popular phrase they use. So, and so, so when I said, when, when uh, Krugman appeals to the notion of truth, it's very, very rare. It's, it's, rare. it's an exception, and I'm not sure whether he would stand for it, you know, he would, he would like to defend it when, when pressed. And actually elsewhere, he has, he has a different story to tell, but for New York Times, you know. And this, this might have something to do with, with this variety of audiences, too. And, uh, and here, is, here is the idea. So for academic audience, a different story is being told. For non-academic audiences, maybe at least if there's an appearance 
uh, that the economists are in possession of the objective truth, they are not the first to remove that <laughs> appearance. <laughs> But for, for, for their fellow economists or students or, or other social scientists, uh, when, when they, these audiences uh, become to be critical of economic models, they say, no, no, this, this is not about truth at all. <laughs> so, and thereby they sort of hedge themselves and protect their models against criticisms. OK. So we move on to model descriptions. Uh, typically, in, in the case of economics, it's uh, rather uh, sophisticated mathematics. Um, it could be whatever, but uh, math is the, the thing. And not just math in general, but certain kinds of math. And then, then one possible uh, source of failure is that this has given rise to overemphasis of considerations of formal tractability in dealing with with models. Maybe this, this uh, obsession with mathematical descriptions of models has uh, dominated the choice of assumptions. And maybe some of the assumptions are so heavily <coughs> idealized, uh, no matter what consequences that has for the under their understanding of the real world, that tractability considerations sort of override everything else. And maybe this in, 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 uh, in turn has, uh, has uh, made, uh, turned surrogate modeling into substitute modeling. Uh, models examining for their own sake without any connection with the real world and, and so forth. Mathematics is itself okay, I would say, no problem. But it might have these sorts of consequences. There are risks in using math for uh, describing the models, and these risks also should be somehow uh, managed. Okay, we move on to commentary. Um, so, have economists perhaps failed or lacked the incentive to be clear about what their models are for and what they are about? What they are capable of doing, how reliable they are, etc. All, all these sorts of things should be part of the commentary about uh, the modeling uh, exercise. And I think there is a major failure right here. And it might be because uh, economists have lacked the, the required self understanding. They just don't want quite understand the whole, the, the complete. Uh, uh, set of components and their interrelations in the modeling exercise. They are too narrow-minded for having that uh, comprehensive picture. And therefore, their commentary is also um, deficient. Or maybe it's just a matter of failed communication. Maybe, it's, it's, maybe they do have a full understanding themselves, but they, they forgot or failed to <coughs> communicate that wisdom to their relevant audiences. It's, they often complain, by the way, that, that they have, we have been misunderstood. They just don't get it. I mean, we are okay, but you just haven't got the message. And uh, but that's a failure of communication on their part. Uh, for instance, I mean, they, they now say they never, even though they were expected to, to be able to predict, and it's sort of part of their official uh, methodological rhetoric that it's a predictive science. Now they say we never claim to be able to predict, as especially these crises or. Etc. Our message has been misunderstood or oversimplified. The policymakers, we don't take the responsibility. It's the politicians. They have misused our ideas. Okay. And then the context, which encompasses a lot of things. Uh, um, non academic sources of risk, non academic context. Uh, here I just w would like to uh, cite a couple of things. There probably is a self-selection of topics and type of types of model that resonate with dominant ideologies. There are, there are always a bunch of uh, sort of outward-reaching economists who talk to politicians who, who appear in, in public and, and so forth, while most of them don't. And, and these, these might be sort of... Uh, they, they might exercise uh, self-selection. They, they uh, select those kinds of uh, 
ideas and models that, that they expect to sell well, as it were, to those external audiences. And then there might be a selection by policymakers and other external audiences of types of models that are in line with their already established uh, worldviews. And of course, the simplification of the content, uh, contents of those models take place, but the, the scientific authority of those models can be exploited by these audiences. Um, and then the academic context and sources of risk uh, right here. Uh, this is an interesting uh, explanation for the failure. I mean, Queen visited uh, London School of Economics, the economics department, and asked, how come you, you didn't warn us that this is coming after the crisis had uh, hit already? And then they, the LSE economists wrote a letter to Queen and explained <coughs> that actually we, we are, you know, each of us is studying just a tiny bit of thing and, and you know, nobody was taking care of the whole picture. So the division of labor, intellectual labor was taken too far. This was the, the explanation for that, that uh, failure of theirs. Um, Avoidance of difficult research issues, uh, investigation of which does not lead to high expected short-term <coughs> academic returns. Short-term academic returns are, I mean, they are the returns you get by publishing tiny bits of uh, inquiry in top-rated uh, journals. And for that, you don't try to address difficult issues, complex issues, big issues, the investigation of which would take years and years and, and so forth. So this same phenomenon that we find in, in the real world, as it were, it's, uh, it's, all, it's, it's here in, inside the academic world as well. So uh, they avoid these big and difficult uh, issues simply because the ac academic reward system is, is uh, what it is. And then they educate students narrowly, not equipping them with the wisdom the students, when they grow up, would need. Uh, learning history, economic history, prior crises, for instance, etc., other social sciences to, to acknowledge the whole complexity of the social systems, etc., philosophy in order to help them understand what they are doing cognitively when they uh, put together models and use them for whatever purpose. And then, of course, academic herd behavior, network ex externalities, all these things uh, take place in the academic uh, context and a source of uh, possible uh, failure. Conversational culture, which is rather, tough. I wonder how it should be, um, not very pluralistic uh, or something like that. Uh, a lot of very stringent disciplinary gatekeeping and, and, and these sorts of things. You either are or you are not an economist. There's a very sharp line between the two. Uh, and, and then, I mean, also the rankings are pretty well defined within the economics profession. You know, credibility, authority, and so forth, well defined. Uh, and, and this, of course, is a source of failure, a possible uh, source of failure. I think I'm very close to the, uh, to the end of it. Uh, there are pressures in managing expertise. Uh, and these pressures pull in two, two opposite directions. Uh, I would say there's a tension between, uh, on the one hand, economists uh, you know, aspiring to appear as epistemically authoritative experts. And on the other hand, they should acknowledge the high risks of modeling making the uncertainties that are involved fully explicit. That would be a matter of risk management. But, you know, in order to appear epistemically authoritative, you should not reveal all the uncertainties uh, that, that cause so much pain to you, or should cause so much pain to you. You should uh, appear very knowledgeable, etc., confident. Uh, you know what recipes you provide to the uh, decision makers and, 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 and so forth. So uh, there's a big. This is a risk for the for the uh, uh, sort of uh, social uh, and scientific authority of economists, if they are if they would be skillful in uh, epistemic risk management. 
So uh, my my question here is: Is it even possible? I mean, would this be even conceivable that the economics profession would <coughs> uh, perform very much better in epistemic uh, risk management? Do they have the capacity of that for that? And do they have the incentives or risk, uh, the interest for exercising skillful uh, risk management uh, in relation to uh, modeling? I, I wonder if I have... Yeah. No, no, yeah. So this is, I think this is the end of it. So there might be a sort of another academic systemic failure lying right there. Uh, that uh, even though this epistemic risk management would be extremely important for avoiding these sorts of real-world failures, policy fa failures, etc., it might be perhaps too much to ask. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Andres, uh, Andres. Uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks very much for this. Uh, two things. One is uh, just uh, um, a suggestion, perhaps, that, that, uh, that would, would it be possible to add another layer of complexity to your model of modeling? Mm -hmm. and, and is it possible that sometimes the process of modeling feeds into the real the processes which are being modeled. Uh, real people perceive what economists are doing and therefore change their behavior. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. And this is a fact, fact of social life. That's right. I think it has been, there has been interesting analysis of it uh, empirically, but uh, it has been uh, fully conceptualized. I mean, the, the use of the term performativity is completely misguided in this connection. I've written uh, things against that idea, but uh, otherwise, this is a fact of, of life. It should be included uh, somehow, yeah. And the other thing is that it's just, I mean, it will sound like an objection, but I don't mean it's an objection. It's just extremely hard to believe some of the non economists that there have been no models of bubbles and different extreme situations in economics. I mean, the game theory is full of simple games which Look like they are tools rather than or and 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 surely I mean, there has been a lot of historical knowledge around ever since the first economics of major crisis. So can you just say that? Sure. Of course, of course, economics is very rich and varied. I mean, it has a long history and all that. But at any given time, especially given its its like the the way that it's academically organized, focus is given just on uh, preference, given just for, for some very selected uh, bunch of uh, models and styles of modeling. Of course, there are, there are resources within economics that could have been used for, for anticipating and conceiving the, this kind of crisis, but they just were not in fashion, so to speak, for whatever reason. I mean, there might be internal reasons within the discipline and external reasons. I mean, the, Times were not sort of favorable to those ideas because uh, the markets were supposed to take care of everything. Okay, Dave. Yeah. Dave, I think you also. Ah. You are the fifth, I think, online. <laughs> okay. But you, you talk about epistemic risk management. You talk about making the uncertainties explicit. My question is. <coughs> Why do you speak of, is it deliberate to speak of risk management so rather than uncertainties management? I, because this is different, I mean, let's assume that one part of how finance markets function is transforming uncertainties into risk because risk can be managed and so So uh, I was just wondering your choice of words here. Uh, uh, might imply a more commodified uh, attitude towards yeah, yeah, this right. management thing. So did you really mean uh, no, I, I, I management? No, I, 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 I didn't even think of it. It just you know, sounded better, <laughs> risk management. 
Okay, that's it's uh okay. it just follows up something we said before. Um I mean in this in a way we look at it like this well it's remarkable that they didn't engage in modeling of uh, bubbles. I mean in a way you might think that this like I suppose I'm asking, is this the only discipline around that hasn't gone into looking at disaster modeling? Uh, no, I suppose it's one question. The other I mean it, it is sort of odd when you when you put it up like that that they didn't engage in uh, looking what would happen to the bubble. And, and the other part of it is, do you think that the models as they are, like the standard models, near, so near classical uh, economics, could be used to, given some of the assumptions, could be used, and this is just following on from your question before, could be used to engage in you know, disaster modeling or bubble modeling or whatever. I mean, do you think that's... Or, the very same model with some modification? Yeah, something? Yep. Probably not. I mean, uh, there are different there are different traditions that could be uh, utilized for, for those purposes. But but those dominant models in the past years have been sort of made for normal times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, so, and yeah. yeah, that's that's the very idea. This is abnormal and and would require something very different. So so it's the wrong model rather than model being not being applied far <coughs> enough or extended. Yeah, here first. Yeah. Uh, I, you, you mentioned that uh, about academic returns, and you mentioned that some were publication here or there. But how about the failure in a system, financing system? That it's also financing that if you do the way it's expected from you, that you get money for research, you get money for that, you get the scholarship or whatever. How much that is also affecting? Yeah, because I mean, you, you, your performance as an economist or wherever, this is, this is uh, generally applicable, is assessed by your peers. And if it happens that the, there is a relative consensus, there is this fashion or whatever, uh, that, you know, a bulk of the members of the economics profession have hold one set of opinions, then it's in your interest to be in that group exactly. in order to be uh, well assessed for those uh, resources. And the same time we can say that decision uh, uh, makers like success. It's also, it goes both ways, like. Yep. Okay. okay. Thanks. Kelly. Yes. Uh, actually, um, never very short, then. Yes. Each of them. <laughs> They're both very short, actually. One, in terms of the professional sphere of the economists, um, you said they keep a very sharp line, you're either an economist or not. So my question is, what is the relationship between economists and mathematicians who would also be doing modeling that is also very useful in economic behavior? Is there a professional rivalry there? And the other thing is, um, in terms of the models, um, what structures the data that goes into the models, or is that the correct way to think about it? I mean. I remember when when Kostas Vakovitsis was talking, he said, well, I don't have data for that. And so as part of the question, really, what sources of data are available to engage in modeling? I mean, is that an issue um, for the context? Just, just uh, start with the latter. Uh, of course, the, the amount of data is far greater now than it, it was 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. And also the technologies for dealing with manipulating, etc., data are far more advanced now than they used to be. And therefore, maybe just because of this reason, the proportion of empirical work has grown tremendously within economics. And that's 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 why right. people just often don't realize that economists are not just playing with their theoretical models. But uh, of course, the way they organize this data, that is increased the body of data, is determined and shaped by the theories they hold. So it doesn't help much anyway. I was kind of do you, uh, so, sorry, do you still want to reply to the first question? The first question was? The prime oh, yeah, right, right. yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, many economics departments hire uh, people from mathematics, uh, even physics, etc because they are capable of building and dealing with this model. But once they are in, of course, they are okay. And they can publish in economics uh, uh, journals, etc. But there is this interesting uh, field called econophysics that's done by physicists, employed by physics departments, studying, for, for instance, the financial market, using physical models, etc. 
uh, and they are not paid much attention to by professional economists. But those models are also different. They, 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 they are in conflict with much of what economists are doing. Okay, no questions here. I have a question. I have several comments. Just okay, maybe we go to the questions and then if we have time, we go to the comments. Or do you want to select one of them? I don't have any questions. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to say a few things. First, bubble modeling. Really few. Yeah, yeah. Few. bubble modeling does happen. It, it happens all the time. It's, it's, it's a problem with the, how to how define bubble, basically. And then, and the modeling problem is going to relate to mostly the problem. Nowadays, the deficits we have. Map and the data. We don't. We don't actually. We don't actually have the data to test everything we want. So that's that's kind of a problem. And, and the lack of, uh, of mathematic tools to analyze the very complex issues is also a problem. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, the problem is more complex. But oh yeah, absolutely. It's far more complex. This was a very very simplifying modeling of modeling. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Uh, Jonathan, then here, and then Klaus. So. Um, I just wanted to say that isn't part of the problem of modeling the whole concept of modeling? It's not uh, actually, it's not an objective rational methodology for measuring a determinant system within a reasonable degree of probability. It's actually a language of power. The idea is it kind of presupposes that thing which it's claimed to measure uh, within what's effectively a chaotic dynamic system. I'm kind of leading on from I mean, I'll just count it. Leading on from which, I was kind of surprised that you left out of your audience in the commercial sector, which plainly <coughs> an awful lot of economic models for the physicists you mentioned, plainly just um, devising short term economic models to, to feed into the financial services sector. That's very sure they're, they're not really concerned with the wider ramifications of the system. And the third one was a kind of stuff around the why not you predict the There was a whole range of economists from. Uh, Minsky on down to sort of Randy Ray and people like that who've done exactly that, but they weren't in the mainstream and excluded and marginalized um, as, as simply being not such a big sharing of capitalism. So I think what's the first question is, is there not a, a real problem with the whole idea of modeling as that's some kind of objective neutral function? So I'm not being rude, but it, uh, I, don't, I do take a point there. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, so. <laughs> You mean to, to assert the noun of the verb modeling asserts a kind of neutral rationality in a system that may be measured a determinate system that obeys certain laws of physics, uh, work for certain laws of probability, whereas for a lot of people like myself, it would be uh, capitalism that it is a random, chaotic, dynamic system uh, in which you can detect the patterns of certainty, possibly in, in certain uh, aspects of it that is characteristic. But, the idea of modeling itself is a linguistic um, construct, a social construct, that presupposes that, that the capitalism is rational, that it's functional, that it's equilibrium based, and that all you need to do is to have computer modeling and you can iron out all the um, problems with it and the uncertainty. So modeling is itself that thing that it claims to be, it presupposes that thing that it claims to be measuring. And that makes it sure. it it's a far more general idea. So of our cognitive uh, ways of cognitively accessing the world. Yeah, question here. Thank you. It's very informative. But I think there's a distinction here about the economics profession and then the academic profession, the academic economists. And I, I'm, I'm not sure whether everything you've said here applies equally with the wider economics profession, for example, mm -hmm. mentioned here. And I think. I myself participated in editing a book about 10 years ago where economists analyzed the Swedish and Finnish crisis in the 1990s and the Indonesian and the Asian crisis in the late 1990s. And there was a whole modeling about the force of high crisis of Bloomsburg. But I think this has profoundly informed and been a part of policy making in the Federal Reserve in the US from 2008. It has been experienced with historical lessons from the 1930s and everything. And they, so there's been quite an active involvement you know, with, with models that try you know, to have claims that they actually explain actual courses of events in the, in the history. And, and the lessons from those have been directly applied immediately in policy making, like in uh, October, September, October 2008. So if we look at the economics profession uh, as a whole, I think the picture may be a little different. 
Yeah, I, I fully agree that that uh, distinction must be drawn. There is a, there is a, sometimes a clear boundary. Also, the sort of the reputational dynamics are very different in these two, with respect to these two groups. The way that uh, uh, academic economists seek to, to maximize their reputations is different from the way that sort of uh, non-academic economists and research institutes and ministries, etc., do the same thing. Okay, final question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I am most agree with what you're saying, but there again, I was pretty much uh, to say that the bubble modeling was has been all the time. I won't say even about the mainstream, it was already in the 1960s, even Greenspan came up from the main so called architect of the whole thing saying that about this irrational exuberance. That was based on the modern mm-hmm. idea that we are creating a bubble. And, 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 and I, I myself in the central banking work all the time saying that there could be bubbles and trying to check the data bubble. And, and, and so very often you just can't identify the problem. But whether there's been modeling and, 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 and conscious bubbles, that has been there all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, Right. That's, that's in, in, in everyday in everyday talk, of yeah. course, bubble is part of this this uh, vocabulary yeah. used, yeah. but turning it to, into a formal model. But even, even uh, trying to figure yeah, out but, but, well, but those, those dominant models in the academic world. I mean, that's uh, yeah. It, it could be that uh, academics was maybe lacking in some sense behind it and here and there. But the other thing which I think is crucial here is this. this, this I would say that it's not so much modeling failure, but it's institutional failure in the sense that, that the guy who was supposed to take care of the problem was, I mean, the classical central bank that was supposed to take the rules out and the qualities of that spike, uh, was now given, given, given the task of only looking at the inflation rate. That you already have made clear in, in many things. So you want just no, a no, brief I to. I think that that's cool, though, that the inflation wasn't the problem. So, central banks were actually, they couldn't even. even they, they felt that they, they couldn't do too much, and then the politicians, mm-hmm. other areas, didn't want to do. And I, I think there, there, there was uh, definitely institutional failure that, that uh, mm-hmm. nobody took the task. The, the, point, the point of this, this uh, exercise was not to, to uh, point to the ultimate uh, uh, guilty agent. Not at all. It just because economics has been e- economics and economics have been among those who have been accused of failure. So I just wanted to have a fairly detailed way of analyzing what kind of failures might possibly be. Uh, taking place within economic uh, modeling. But obviously, I mean, many, many kinds of agents fail in their own ways, in their own uh, realms, as it were. And of course, it it has been mainly an institutional failure, if I fully agree on that. Okay, I think we have... Success. I, it's, 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 it's tremendous success. <laughs> <laughs> the board. Yes. And empowering the board. Yes. Okay. I, I think we have to, to stop. We have first to thank uh, Uskali for his.